Nintendo settles with the feds. Sierra and Broderbun plan to tie the knot. And Cinemaware is dead. These stories and many more on the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I'm your host, Carl, and as always, here's my co-host, Peter. Say hi, Peter. Hi. Excellent. So, Peter, we are recording on a Saturday night when we're normally supposed to have already launched an episode on Thursday. Yes. Let's see if that gives us fodder for our mandatory banter. Hmm... I think so. I mean, some people are in night fever, some are partying if it wasn't for Corona, and we are doing the good stuff. We are recording a podcast, so... But so late, so late. So late. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was caught up in... How work. dare you? How dare you have a job? How dare you have a job coming home <laughs> at 8.30 and going straight to bed right before getting up in the morning, getting back to work. Dude, I, I, I'm stupid. Just I'm, okay. I'm just stupid. <laughs> well, next week we're going to have to get it done right. I finally got my date to get my vaccine jab on. Oh. Next Friday, so. Then. Next Friday. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. Following up, which I already accomplished. The well, perks of working in healthcare. Have you gotten both or have you only gotten one? <laughs> oh, I've just gotten one. I get this. See, I'm I'll going get Johnson & Johnson, one and done. So. Screw you. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I did it on Friday so I wouldn't have to miss any work. And then basically if I am... KO from the employee. shot, it's going to happen over the weekend. So You're in good employee, and this is what I did last time. Got the shot on Thursday, became uh, sick, well, sick, normal uh, vaccine reaction. On Friday afternoon, got out of bed Monday morning and was good <laughs> to go back to work. But the weekend, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably what's going to happen to me. So we need to make sure that we're recording on Wednesday or something because oh, I yeah. will not be able to record on Friday for sure. Oh, but, I, oh I well. think we can record on Wednesday. I that's dearly good. hope so. I get my second shot on uh, June the 10th. Oh, so you still got a little ways. So, But as yeah. soon as you're fully vaxxed, I'm fully vaxxed, we might actually be able to record on site again. On site? Oh, shit. This means I have to sit right next to you, dude. I don't know feel you know. I I don't know how a human presence feels anymore. You mean all your sarcastic remarks will disappear <laughs> once you're in my physical presence, and you're afraid that I'm going to try to hit you or something? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and all the human smell. Oh lord. <laughs> Hey, 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 it's not a human smell. Some A good friend of mine once said I smelled like pork sweat. I'm not sure what that <laughs> meant. But... Oh, well, okay. Getting sexy in here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, 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 yeah. that's enough. So, let's get uh, this episode, we're going to be traveling back 30 years to find out what was making headlines in the video game and computer industry in. May of 1991. And remember, we're always using cover dates of publications for that measurement. So obviously all the events happen at some time before that. And, you know, some magazines uh, a little bit early. Some magazines are always a little bit late. Blah, 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 blah. Disclaimer over. Uh, you can also follow us on all the social medias. You can uh, become a Patreon patron. And one of the great benefits of becoming a Patreon patron, other than getting our interview episodes three months early, and, you know, sometimes uh, we have little communi communiques for the patrons and whatnot, not a lot, but oh well, uh, is also that you get exclusive access 
to the video version of our dearly beloved segment, Seven Minutes in Heaven, Hell. where Peter gets to enjoy seven minutes of playtime with a game that was reviewed in one of this month's publications. And I and you can't see it right now, but well, if you become a patron, you'll be able to see the expression of horror on his face as oh, Lord. Peter goes back in time. And what was the name of the game you got to play? It was Dragon's Lair Time Warp. Dragon's Lair 2. On the Commodore Amiga. Oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so let's check it out. Dragon's Lair Time Warp. Peter, welcome back from your seven minutes. Uh, In hell, you know, yes. Explain to us what is Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp all about, based on your gameplay experience. <laughs> Just based on my experience, it's about dying all over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, so basically, it's like you're a knight or something like that, and... Uh, in the beginning of the game, there's a pretty angry lady, which looks like a Valkyrie. Uh, she has a giant, oh god, what's the name of this kitchen tool? Rolling um, pin. R that thing, and um, she's pretty angry that someone is kidnapped yet again. And you flee from her and run into the castle where there's a giant snake that will always and immediately kill you, and this is basically the entire game. This is also the end of the game. <laughs> uh, yeah, that 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 does uh, jive with uh, what I saw of your gameplay experience. Yes. So I um, played the entire game. <laughs> oh lord! No, but it's um you you have to um it's more like a, a an um a long quick time event game. You have to push a button at the exact right moment into in the at the exact right uh, direction mm. to like avoid being hit by this kitchen tool or by some weird giant snakes at the uh, drawbridge or by the snake in the castle. Thing is, nothing tells you what to do. The game doesn't tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Um, so it's pretty much a guessing game, which button, which direction to push in what exact second um, to avoid being hit and dying. You have three lives. Mm, you could have uh, as well just have one life or five lives. It doesn't matter. You will get... <laughs> To the game over screen over and over again. Dark Souls player are uh, welcome here to try out their luck. <laughs> um, and you know what? I think being in an arcade, I would have been really frustrated. I was frustrated here at home, but I was, it was, and this is the weird thing, I was frustrated, but I wanted to go on. Oh, really? I wanted to see, it. yeah, I wanted to see how the story develops or why who was kidnapped why she was kidnapped i guess it was a she uh where she was brought to who kidnapped her i really wanted to know that um but being in an arcade and what was it like 50 cents for three lives 50 cents. wonderful uh it would have drained my cash so quickly um yeah 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 this is this is just insane and i think this is done on purpose and i think this is just a a way to well get the money of nerds. Um, they would have yeah, my yeah. Money. That that is a good assessment of the situation. Now, um, <laughs> this is the long delayed sequel to the original Dragon's Lair, which came out uh, in the early '80s, and uh, we're going to be running up on the 40th anniversary of that game very quickly. So. Yeah. We may actually revisit the original arcade version uh, for seven minutes of In Heaven soon. Um, mm -hmm. 
just because it was such a revolutionary piece of hardware. And uh, this one came out, I think, seven years later. Uh, it had been just sitting on a shelf. They had finished the animation years earlier, but the market for these kind of Laserdisc games basically dried up very, very quickly mm -hmm. uh, after the initial uh, thrill of it was over. And uh, then when the home versions were finally somewhat plausible, uh, they had ported the original Dragon's Lair in two parts to the Amiga, Atari ST, and DOS machines uh, through this technique where they're streaming the imagery directly off of the uh, floppy disks. That's how they were able to get those scenes working the way they did, because you couldn't have put all of that in one meg of memory. Then uh, they were, then they said, "Okay, cool, we can do this. Uh, we've got the other game. You know, it's getting popular." And the home port actually came out before the arcade version hit the streets, but it didn't make a splash. I mean, the arcade cabinets went out, and uh, I only ever saw one in the wild. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, you were so excited about Dragon's Lair 1, and this made me so excited about playing Dragon's Lair 2. Is Dragon's Lair 1 uh, comparable to that in terms of difficulty and throwing yourself into the cold water? Uh, yes and no. When you play the, the arcade version, it's not quite as bad as this mm -hmm. because uh, one of the things the original Dragon Slayer, and I want to say Dragon Slayer 2 Time Warp also had, was that uh, they would always have something flash on the screen to at least give you a hint as to which direction you had to go when. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is missing at least from this version. I can't remember if it was in the original port of Dragon's Lair, but at least in this version, Time Warp, that is missing completely. And, Dude, and this is because I was not kidding around. I was playing on super, super hard mode. Yeah, there's there's no difficulty settings in the game. Just no, no, but there are those saying. buttons on the Amiga, and I pushed the hard mode button. Yeah, no, that, that, that's not how the... You're thinking of the Atari 2600. <laughs> and that wasn't an excuse for your performance in Missile Command Dude, either. You, you you decimated me last time. I was so proud of myself. And no, no, you know, don't... don't <laughs> say, yeah, Lord, I can't um, win. I just can't win. Just because <laughs> you were playing at the lowest of 30 difficulty levels does it not mean that you did poorly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I don't know the, whether or not I'm insulted, but let's go on. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is that, yeah, uh, Dragon Slayer, they, they gave you some hints on the screen as to where to go and how to play. Uh, they left them out, at least at this version, and I think the reason they did that was you're paying 50 to 60 bucks for this game. Yeah, probably, well, probably more like 50 bucks at the time it's coming on six floppy disks which is absolutely huge for the time and the problem is that uh if they gave you even the slightest hint you'd probably get through it way too quickly i mean if you don't make any mistakes you can probably play through the entire game in under 12 minutes so to justify that cost and the purchase and everything else they kind of have to do something. And taking out the hints, is that something? Oh, sure. Increasing the difficulty, making it even more ridiculous is always a way to make a game last longer. Exactly, exactly. And of course, you know, having to jump, uh, uh, flip floppy disks back and forth every time you die to get the loading screen back and stuff. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. So if you die on like the 10th screen, which is on floppy disk 6, you have to put in floppy disk 1 to start all over. Because you have to start from the beginning again, yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord is right. Believe me, as somebody who played it back in the day, oh, Lord. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, Time Warp was a bit of a pain in the ass to play. Yeah. I mean, so there's so many... Consider yourself lucky uh, that you're in the land of emulation. Oh, yes. Dude, <laughs> I wouldn't have paid, like... I mean, counting the the times I died before I started recording, 
I think I would have been in at least 20 bucks. At least, yeah. At least. Yeah. Well, I mean, and this is why these games didn't last very long. I mean, uh, I remember it just staring at it as a kid and the intro video that, that was playing constantly was just so mesmerizing. And it's Don Bluth. I mean, he's a legend in animation. Uh, the Secret of Nim, uh, Land Before Time, American Tale. I mean, the guy is just a animation god. Yeah. And this was something that you'd never seen before. It was sort of dark and it was fantasy, you know, with knights and dragons and the princess and everything else. It it totally captivated you, uh, especially if you were a cartoon craze kid like I was. Mm. And so that's what kept people coming back to the game and not because it was a great experience and we will maybe talk and play some of the home ports that showed up on the 8-bit computers where they tried to replicate that quick time feel yeah. uh, with sprite based graphics mm -hmm. uh, to more or less success so uh, we will look at those games maybe in the future if we get a chance because yeah. they are interesting. But um, yeah, okay. You know what? Let's go back to 1991 and talk about the things that really matter. Well, before we can go to May of 1991, first we have to go back and see what we screwed up when we went to April of 1991 with our good friend Ethan in a little segment we like to call the Department of Corrections. Welcome back, Ethan. So, what did I screw up in our... Well, Wait, before we get to that, yes. before we get to my mistakes from April of 1991, we have important business. The Peter. Hunt! I try to like, you know, big. big very nice. Very thing. nice. Okay. So, uh, Peter mentioned that, uh, you know, when Nintendo goes bankrupt, he'll have to drag you out of the grave. And I will be <laughs> there to listen, even if I have to do it for my own grave. <laughs> We, I will be there. I will be your audience of one for the <laughs> for the uh, video game newsroom time machine dead edition podcast. Excellent. Yes, I, I'm looking forward to that myself. It will be the uh, the Nintendo post mortem at uh, at Game Developers Conference. Shall be a very interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, who knows? So now, Maybe at some point they'll get bought up by EA and EA will No, no. Months. Do not say these things, <laughs> Carl. Do not say these things. Uh, so, uh, it's, time, it's time to stamp right on your head. Fail. Fail. Yes, true, true. I failed. Yes. yes. <clears throat> How did I fail? Small ways this time, I think. But okay. uh, for, first of all, American Video Entertainment, you said that they reverse engineered the NES uh, chip, you know, did, did what Tangan did, but legally, but actually not the case. Uh, AVE and I think Codemasters had their own specialized solution where they actually ran a pulse, a voltage pulse through the system to freeze the lockout chip. On the oh. NES. And the revision that you talked about in the episode is basically Nintendo added some resistors onto the oh. board to prevent that from happening. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, Kevtris, you know, the famous uh, FPGA implementer, examined all the different ways that people got past the lockout chip. And that was AVE's solution. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I know that they actually bought the technology from somebody else. I found that in my research, but I didn't find the exact technology. So I just assumed, and I probably should never do that, I assumed that uh, it was a reverse engineering. But the pulse actually sounds far more correct and also explains why they were locked out when the other cartridges weren't from the revision. Yes. So that there, there were several different methods of getting through the, the lockout chip. And again, Kevtris has kind of documented all of those. Good on you, Mr. Kevtris. 
<laughs> Very good. It's good to have people like that in the community. So, um, and here's the and big the, one, right? Yes. Uh, well, it, 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 this is not something you got wrong necessarily. It's just the I, I just want to try and explain the story here behind the Nintendo Sony Nintendo PlayStation deal. Though there's still stuff that we don't really know, but basically uh, the the story as we know it, which may or may not be true, is that Nintendo signed this deal with Sony to do some sort of uh, CD-based something. Whether it was add-on or integrated is actually a question because uh, the like that, that famous Play Nintendo PlayStation prototype that showed up a couple years ago is not the only PlayStation prototype that has ever showed up. Before that happened, I remember seeing pictures of several different versions. Some were integrated and some were add-ons. I don't know how many of those were completely legit, but I have been told by at least somebody that some of those were legit. Uh, Frank, Frank Cifaldi has seen these actually in person, and he knows that they are actually legit. Um, hmm. So whether it was a standalone or an add-on, they signed this deal, and Nintendo, supposedly, when they were rereading the deal of the contract, they realized that Sony was going to be able to have complete control over the CD-ROM-based software uh, that would be developed for this add-on integrated thing. Uh, they didn't really like that, so they uh, decided that they were going to force Sony out by basically making it so the they couldn't work it in the market by partnering with Philips, too. Um, so, like, they... You know whether it was a formal contract or not is 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 a question in itself. But um, the big myth out of this is that at uh, the uh, the CES uh, they announce on stage that they're going with Philips, and then all the the Sony executives are standing in the audience like, whoa, whoa, what just happened? But that's not true. Uh, <laughs> they they knew beforehand, and actually there's a scene in the book uh, Console Wars which. Take it as a shaky thing in terms of, uh, you know, actual mm -hmm. fact, but they uh, say that on the train ride to CES, where Arakawa and Lincoln were going, uh, the Sony executives called up on onto the train and were trying to convince them not to go into this deal because it had already been reported, which is kind of one of the, the benefits of this podcast. You can see when things are directly re reported, and then you can uh, check against the, the myth later. Yeah, and I actually have uh, several more articles uh, and mentions of this coming down the pipeline over the next few months as the stories get uh, cleared up, so to speak. There's a, a couple of good quotes from Howard Lincoln in a New York Times article mm. a few months down the line. There were issues with the contract, uh, and last time we're going to touch on the Nintendo PlayStation story here on the show just because uh, there is more information coming out. I just really wanted to cover something last month just because of that first mention of the word PlayStation. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I couldn't find an earlier source uh, using that terminology. So I thought it was a cool thing to mention. And there had been some rumors about a Sony-based uh, CD-ROM add-on before that. I just didn't mention them before because they were just rumors. And so, yeah. But, yeah, it's it's one of those ones where I'd love someday to get my hands on a copy of that contract. Oh, the, <laughs> the lawyer in me is just like, ooh, that would be fun reading. I mean, it would all be in Japanese, so. Still, you can get that translated. I got a good buddy of mine. He's a lawyer who also speaks Japanese. I'd have a field day with this one. <laughs> yeah, so th there's a lot of question about what happens afterwards. You know, eventually it becomes its own separate project. But it seems like Sony was still trying to finagle Nintendo into a s certain spot. There's some stories that Philips and Sony and Nintendo were kind of trying to work together. But it's all really confusing at the moment. So uh, mm. just just be careful what, be careful what you cover around some of this. Of course. Of course, of course. Always keep it, well, this is what they were saying at the time, and we've got no freaking clue what actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else for April of 1991? 
nope, that will be all for April of 1991. And Excellent. We will talk to you next time in April of 2001. Excellent. Till then. You know, um, first of all, I think we are still getting better and your research improves drastically because there wasn't too much going on. Too much that needed correction. However, I really love the idea that they have this um, little EMP device in their cart, which is <laughs> that kills the lockout ship. This is amazing. Yeah, it's it, not EMP. It's, it's I mean, still, it wasn't. It was an EMP device, but yeah, basically that's what they were doing—a little electrical shock to uh, to uh, disable it temporarily. <laughs> uh, pretty cool, and this is also why. Uh, the rev revision of the NES uh, at Christmas couldn't play their games because it was made resistant to that electrical shock. Dude, can you imagine how that is like being this shocker in the cartridge and you, you shock this, uh, you, you, you shock the, uh, oh lord. The console? Getting, yeah, thank you. I'm getting the story messed up. So yeah, yeah. Fix vanishes, but. Um, <laughs> you, you shock the console and you're like, ha, gotcha. And the next time you want to shock it, it's just all there in insulation and being like, screw you. I'm insulated <laughs> now. <laughs> That's awesome. Basically, basically. I have a little cartoon going on in my head. Too much strength there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially since all those games were terrible. So, yes. Um. <laughs> okay. So, and yeah. yeah, enough about that. Let's turn on the time machine and head back to May of 1991. The market's very fickle. Welcome to May of 1991. Peter, what's our first story? Nintendo settled suit with government. The Federal Trade Commission has closed their investigation of Nintendo's monopolistic practices. The multi-year inquiry into how the Big N was dominating the market and forcing retailers to keep prices on systems consistent has led to every purchaser of a game cartridge getting a $5 coupon for the purchase of a new Nintendo seal of approval game. Oh, and... $3 million for the 35 states that joined the suit. This is not an admission of guilt, and Atari suit against the House of Mario continues on. Dennis Woods, senior vice president of Atari Games, the Tengen people, tried to put a positive spin on it, but without the feds breathing down their neck, Howard Lincoln takes a defiant tone against Atari's action. Okay. So uh, Nintendo and the FTC were, uh, were, were before court and um, as a result of that, Nintendo has to give every purchaser of a new cartridge a $5 coupon. Well, I don't know if they actually made it to court. It was more of an investigation into them that could have led <laughs> to a lawsuit. Okay. And so this is an out of uh, a pre- uh, uh, pre-settlement. So okay. an out-of-court settlement. So we give you money and you shut the hell up. Uh, basically. So they're giving the states um, three million bucks, which is a, a drop in the pan distributed over 35 states. And uh, the compensation of, here's a coupon and you're going to have to go out and buy another $50 <laughs> cartridge is doing nothing but actually increasing the number of Nintendo games <laughs> exactly. sold. It's, Dude, there's there's this one hilarious scene from Trailer Park Boys, and and yes, I'm watching Trailer Park Boys. I'm I'm sorry, but show. it's great my, show. Thank no, no, you. I love Trailer Park Boys. I mean, I'll I, give you a hundred dollars to fuck off. <laughs> and and it's not only that; it's it's more of a I will give you a coupon <laughs> that you will have to tenfold. To fuck off. <laughs> yes. It's it, it's absolutely brilliant. This this whole thing, it, the fact that Nintendo was able to pull this off despite there being pretty ample evidence of abuse of monopolistic power, uh, 
is, I mean, it's, this is just ballsy as all hell. Uh, I mean, who on the side of the FTC agreed to that? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know what the internal politics on this were. I'm <laughs> sure like that... the intern was the internal politics man. Can you imagine this guy like who agreed to this deal coming to this boss and be like, hey boss, I m I've made this great deal and he tells him what he did and the boss is like, dude, pack your stuff, you're fired. No. I'm <laughs> sure that they looked at it as come on, dude, it's video games. And also remember, this is right as the 16-bit systems are already on the market and stuff. So there, there is, there is this change in the market coming to the extent that you know it. You might punish them for something that they've already, and and this is pure speculation on my part. But it would not surprise me if the FTC had been informed of Nintendo's moves that we reported on the last few months where mm -hmm. they suddenly said, oh, yeah, third parties, you can port your games to other systems. Oh, yes, y certain third parties can manufacture their own cartridges and stuff. Mm -hmm. So those moves from the last few months were there to appease the government. Okay. And so a lot of that happened. And we will see Nintendo not have their hugely monopolistic power in the 16-bit generation. They mm -hmm. just can't pull off the same tricks anymore. And so it's having the, the effect that was desired. It doesn't make up for the damage to the competitors, uh, especially, I mean, Sega, which has basically been cr half crippled or at least – handicapped the last two <laughs> years with the Genesis because they couldn't get Konami titles. They couldn't get Capcom titles. Uh, they, they just were not getting the software support they needed yeah. that they really could have used to get the Genesis off the ground. Okay. And they will get that over the next couple of years. It's just, you know, it would have been nice if they had it back in 89 when they launched the Genesis in North America. <laughs> And uh, Atari's suit has, I mean, the Tengen people have no leg to stand on because they broke the law uh, by making the cartridges. And Tremel is going to go cheap on his lawyer. So that's, uh, it is what it is. And the interesting thing is uh, this month, because everybody is gearing up for CES, Nintendo actually ran a bunch of full page ads in one of the trade magazines, uh, toy trade magazines, where they actually touted the Super Nintendo and they were talking about how the 16 bit generation seems to be lackluster so far. But that's only because their machines aren't truly 16 bit, they're just, you know, revamped 8 bit. There, the Super Nintendo will be the true 16-bit that does real 16-bit things. Hmm. And that lackluster is mainly because of Nintendo, you know, stifling competition. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's Nintendo at its dickishest, uh, hmm. most dickish. Uh, and yeah, but this brings to the end the, uh, federal investigation of nintendo's practices okay um however i think some of that behavior still is with nintendo up to today i mean if there's an Int a nintendo game being thrown onto the market you can't just buy it as well to the release because they are not getting cheaper uh no they're not getting cheaper and um nintendo is also in the position where they i i mean Nintendo does its own thing, and Nintendo also knows the value of their property. I mean, they're still selling you copies of Super Mario Brothers to this day. Uh, there's really no reason for them to bargain basement anything if they don't have to. Oh, yeah. Mm. This is... I don't really know. I don't really know how this works with Nintendo. I mean, why are the games not getting cheaper even today? I mean, back in the day, okay, the locker chip, all the stuff, got it. Cartridges, 
got it. But even today with the entire online selling stuff, I mean, there are uh, deals every now and then in the Nintendo eShop. However, it's really not that major. But and oh my, well. my going theory on this is simple. You don't buy a Nintendo Switch to play a 15-year-old Elder Scrolls game. No. You buy I mean, it some to pay <laughs> Nintendo software. Yes. So if that was the reason you bought it, then why should they sell it to you cheap? Yeah, exactly. You're here to play the Nintendo software. I mean, they sold you Mario Kart, the same one that was released on the Wii U, again on the Switch. Not again. <laughs> but it just, well, that's it's because nobody bought the Wii U. Wii U but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, this whole idea of, you know what, if the game is still fun today, why, just because it's old, does it have to be uh, dropped in price? Why does a game have to get cheaper just because time has gone by if the value for money proposition is still there? Yes. Yes, I mean, from the point of view of Nintendo, it totally makes sense. But, you know, like every other game company, you have this fall in the prices over exactly. time. The, the, the older the game gets, and you can even buy them fairly cheap. I mean, a used Nintendo game is like, what is it, like five bucks or ten bucks cheaper than uh, buying a new one, a new version of that? Uh, and, and it has simply to do with the fact that they their market is there to buy their games and they don't have to try to attract some casual uh, player for a couple of additional bucks. They know if the person buying a switch in year five is buying it to play Mario Kart, they're oh, yeah. buying it to play um, a Zelda, uh, whatever it wasn't wind waker. It was uh, uh, breath of the wild. That was a launch game. Well, who cares? If you're buying the Switch today, that's probably the game you're going to play. Uh, so there, there's no economic reason to sell it cheaper. Oh, no, there is not. Exactly. And But with ev every other game, I mean, if I buy an Xbox in year five, the older Assassin's Creed games... Okay, there's a new one coming out. So, yeah, of mm -hmm. course, I don't want to cannibalize, and I and I just want to get some extra sales, so I'm going to drop the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also people are selling that even more. I mean, the Nintendo uh, games, I think people that bought a Nintendo game as a cartridge, a disc, a uh, SD card clone, whatnot, they just keep it. Exactly. They just keep it. And, I mean, you can't blame them. I mean, these are the games that you keep coming back to. They're usually not one-and-done yeah. games. They so, age so well, usually. Usually. Have you gone back to some of the old N64 games? This is why I say usually. They, they have A lot of those have not aged gracefully. <laughs> yeah, but, it's all those old graphics, but then... Anyway, we have more topics, and yes, Nintendo tons, has tons. more than enough market power and more than enough money to do their own marketing. Um, next topic. Game Sticking Genie with... wins court in Canada. Uh, say that one more time. Game Genie wins court in Not Canada. Wins court. What did I say? You said wins court. <laughs> Wins court. <laughs> don't you know Wins court, man? No, no, I don't know Wins court. <laughs> <laughs> One more time with gusto. Game Genie wins in court in Canada. A federal court in Canada has lifted the injunction that was preventing Comerica from selling the Game Genie in Canada. The unlicensed NES peripheral that allows for modification of gameplay experiences through codes will be able to hit the streets in Canada while Nintendo continues to battle against the device in the USA. The court explained that Nintendo had not shown any evidence to prove that they had lost a single sale due to the device. 
And why should they? Well, because they well, were the well, ones bringing the suit, claiming that the device was going to harm their market. Yeah, well, but this is just bull crap. It isn't. It's a cheating device. It's a cheating device. Uh, and the idea that they were going to lose sales was based on the concept that if people could cheat, mm -hmm. they'd get through the games faster. If they got through the games faster, they wouldn't think that it was a good uh, return on investment, uh, that, the, that the value wouldn't be there anymore. And then they might get disheartened and not buy any more games. Oh, yeah. So if you cheat, so you become invincible and can run through walls and you just run from the beginning to the end of all the other levels. It wasn't a good return on investment because the game was so bad. However, <laughs> if they had Pokemon back then, I would have uh, I would have understood this argument. No, I mean, it, you had RPGs and stuff. I mean, the, there is a certain argument there that when you use cheat codes, you know, you're not going to have the challenge. Remember, a lot mm -hmm. of games back then, similar to things like, let's say, Dragon's Lair Time Warp, uh, the games themselves weren't that long. That's why you have these speed runs. Yes. Uh, no, no, and but... the difficulty is what gave them longevity. Yeah, no, but what I mean with Pokemon is um, Pokemon usually, as you might know, is sold in two versions. Uh, and there are never all of the Pokemon you can catch in each version. So you actually have to buy two versions or trade Pokemon with a friend, is what they say, but basically with yourself by having bought two versions of Pokemon. And, and having those two Game Boys with the link cable. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you might just borrow a Game Boy or whatever. Uh, anyways, um, but with those cheating devices, you can just like cheat in the missing Pokemons because the data of the Pokemons is actually in the game. Uh, this is true. This is true. That would all be, uh, be an option. And there will be a Game Genie for the Game Boy. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, th this is one of those moments where Uh, it's a precursor to what's going to happen in the States. The Game Genie will be allowed. And mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to be able to stop it. And it's going to show up for no. all the major consoles of the time. I think this is just Nintendo being as they usually are, dickish about their licenses and their property. Oh, yeah. They don't want anybody profiting from the machine that, without getting their piece of the pie. Yes. I mean, up to today, they are pretty hard on YouTubers talking about Nintendo stuff. Dude, of they course, might have yes. e they might even become hard on us because we're talking about what they did like uh, 30 <laughs> years ago. Uh, <sighs> I yeah, always wanted yeah, to get sued. I'm not going to worry about it just yet. As soon as as <laughs> soon as we have enough YouTube listeners yes. or viewers to monetize this bitch, that will be a problem <laughs> I will worry about then. Until then... We're not in it for the money, man. We are in it for the passion. <laughs> And this is why we, like, every other minute remind people that they can go on Patreon if you have a dollar. <laughs> exactly. You can support us with uh, for as low as a dollar. <laughs> Um, <laughs> You're really going for that right now. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. What I'm trying to say is we do this for the love of the game, the passion, the the interest. Exactly. But, you know, we won't turn down money if it's offered. <laughs> no. I mean, people, come on, have us being able to quit our jobs so we can <laughs> live on <off> that. <laughs> uh, that would be the dream. No, not really. No, okay. nah, maybe. Uh, Who knows? Okay. Oh, let's keep sorry. moving. Sorry. Um, we got a lot to get through today. Yes, <laughs> let's get right to the next topic because I'll just, I won't just stop laughing. Uh, Accolade goes ballistic on the Genesis. Computer game publishing veteran Accolade has launched their new ballistic label to release unlicensed games for the Sega Genesis. While most of the titles would be ports of computer games like Star Control, Test Drive 2, and Turrican, they would also bring the arcade classic Double Dragon to Sega's 16-bit machine. After some legal wrangling, Accolade would get an official license from Sega and launch titles like The Lost Vikings before the label was dissolved. 
this is such a cool story. So uh, Accolade, they, they, they founded a, a label called Ballistic. Yeah. They shot at Sega. And as soon as they hit, they're like, okay, that's at real dissolve. Well, it's uh, the deal is like this. Uh, Sega did not, uh, and we've talked about this before, and the, the Michael Katz uh, interview uh, goes into this <laughs> in good detail. Uh, link in the show notes below. Remember, links to everything that we talk about in the show notes below. Uh, because he was the head of Sega at the time when a lot of this stuff was going down. What happened was that the Sega engineers did not really do a good job of protecting the games. Mm -hmm. So Trip Hawkins was the first one to, uh, from EA, they were the first ones to reverse engineer how the Genesis worked and had the capability of making unlicensed cartridges. And once EA did it, everybody pretty much could get in on the action. So while Sega would go after a lot of people, and I don't remember all the details of how Accolade did it, blah, 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 but uh, Sega basically started making sweetheart deals with everybody just so, to, you know, to keep them on, on brand. Uh, but it was sort of an, a little bit of a free-for-all in this period because – Everybody could, if they really wanted to put their uh, their minds to it, reverse engineer it, figure out how to make an unlicensed cartridge, and then go it without Sega's support. Hmm. Yeah. And, and all this was legal. So. Well, if you're doing it properly, it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, this was a problem for Sega, and you can tell that – they, 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 Sega was an arcade manufacturer, and yes, they had had consoles before this, but they, they really didn't think through this whole licensing model and locking people out stuff properly uh, when designing the hardware. And this, although Nintendo gave such a great example. Exactly. That's, that's the crazy part. It's not like Nintendo where they had to invent this concept. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, these guys are coming in years later. They've, they, all they had to do was do a little bit of market research, figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, this is happening is kind of sad and pathetic. But you know, and Accolade. I mean, these are not necessarily the best games in the world, and they're not really um, porting them over in the best possible way. But it is kind of telling that, you know, this is how the American computer game publishers are getting on the console. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, EA first and now Accolade. Uh, so it's it, it's a way for them to transition onto the system to get some experience with console game manufacturing. And... It's going to help increase the number of games available for the system. And let's face it, at this point, the Genesis needs a lot of help. Mm -hmm. Because they don't really have a lot of Japanese support. No. And they never, never will. <laughs> oh, no, they will. They will. They will get the support. Um, it's just... Uh, it's going to come a little bit later because everybody had to first wait for Nintendo to drop their um, their their stances, and then obviously you still got to develop the software and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still way too late. Yeah. Um, anyhow, let's just move on because I'm really looking forward to our next topics. You promised me some companies going broke. And some... we still got some before we get there, but yes, if we will get there. Yeah, I'm I have a weird obsession with companies getting broke. I, I I've noticed. I have noticed. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Thomas Radigan wins suit against Commodore. Former Commodore CEO Thomas Radigan who had been fired from the position after just a year of his four-year contract was served, has won his suit against the company. 
While he had pulled Commodore back from the brink of bankruptcy, his high profile seems to have irked Irving Gould so much that he had so much that he had him canned in April of 1987. So Irving Gould was like, oh, well, he's successful. Too successful. Basically, uh, the story goes and how much uh, veracity is behind it, I don't know. But uh, Radigan got this big uh, picture of himself on the front cover of uh, Commodore's uh, own published magazine at the time. And that just er irked Irving Gould. He wanted to be, you know, (laughs) it irked him. He didn't want anybody to be more important than him and the company. And so he had him canned. Had him escorted out of the building. Uh, yeah, I mean, bad movie. Uh, it, it is. It is. When you really think about it, it's uh, you. You have these guys who are super rich. They own these companies, and it's just these weird little ego issues. Sometimes mm-hmm. it. It really is kind of weird. So uh, Radigan won the case, but I think he didn't go back uh, to Commodore, did he? No, 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 he no. He just no. got the he money for already... the three years, and he was like, screw you guys, I'm in the Bahamas. I, well, no, he was working at other companies in the meantime. I mean, okay. he, Radigan had a big career before this, and he would go on to have a career in other uh, companies after this. Uh, this was just kind of a blip, but it, it goes to show where the headspace of Commodore is at this point. Uh, and uh, it's, let me put it this way, it's not going to get any better from this point forward. Oh, yeah. Okay, foreshadowing, and we'll see in the future what will come out of that. Exactly. Uh, but until then, Sierra buys Brodebund, or do they? German magazine ASM reports that Broderbund has been gobbled up by Sierra. While negotiations concerning a merger had been ongoing, they did not actually lead to such a merger and both companies would continue on their own paths. While Sierra had already gone public in 1989, Broderbund would make the leap in November of 1991. So did the Germans just have a translation error or were they just a little bit quick firing? No, actually, and it wasn't just them. I got links to a couple of other magazines that also reported on this story this month. Pretty much everybody believed it was a foregone conclusion because uh, both uh, the heads of Sierra and Broderbund announced it. And uh, if memory serves me right, it gets nixed. Uh, And again, I talked to Ken Williams about it in my interview with him, link in the show notes below. Uh, And it was basically the boards of uh, of the companies that nixed the deal. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of sad because it could have been a major powerhouse, especially at a time when Broderbund uh, was beginning to sort of hit certain limits in what they could and couldn't do. Um, My interview with uh, uh, Gary Carlson, we go into that quite a bit um, up on Patreon right now. And uh, he left the company shortly before this uh, because... Uh, It was getting too big, it was getting too risky, and it was just becoming too stressful. It was like every product had to be a hit, or because the budgets were going up, one failure could mean uh, kablooey, and they hadn't really expanded. They didn't have the the, uh, public uh, money coming in the way that Sierra did to continue their expansion, to acquire new studios, and so forth. So this was a merger that would have brought Sierra uh, essentially a functioning educational division with um, products like Aware in the World is Carmen San Diego and the print shop, and at the same time would have allowed Broderbund to continue their operations uh, and take risks that they couldn't afford to take uh, on their own. Yeah. 
So they had to be really cautious. Um, can you just remind me, oh, will this take too long? Um, how long Broderbahn in this constellation continued to live? Broderbun actually stays around uh, for quite a while. I mean, in theory, they still exist today as a company. Yeah. Uh, but they end up getting purchased by the learning company in 1998. So oh. they actually survive until 98. Okay. But, yeah, the learning company buys them, and then the learning company gets bought by, I believe it's a Mattel? Uh, no, not Mattel. Uh And I talked to the guy who actually made the deal. And uh, it, it's basically, it just becomes a uh, a mess after that. Okay. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, situations where once they get acquired by somebody else, then, you know, they really don't have the control that they used to have. And this is one of the things that Sierra probably would have let them just do what they wanted to until Sierra, and at least Ken Williams, lost control. Because that's what he did with Dynamics and a bunch of the other studios he purchased. He just basically let them do what they were going to do. Oh, yeah. And nice. uh, I don't think uh, Broderbund would have been affected by it. It's just... Uh, once they were acquired by the learning company and there were a lot of reasons for that purchase, it, it, it wasn't going to go anywhere anymore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, moving on. Um, Amiga Power is born. That's right. Uh, the greatest game magazine dedicated to the Amiga and possibly any system ever is born. Cheeky, witty, often pubescent, but still not as pubescent as the guys over at Ace. Amiga Power would become the speakers of truth about Amiga games as the system reached its apex and nadir. I have absolutely nothing to say to that because I do not know Amiga Power. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amiga Power was an English uh, Amiga games magazine, and uh, it... Yeah, I mean, I read it uh, for eh, about two years while I was living in Seattle. And uh, it didn't, I mean, it lasted 65 issues. So it lasted until 1996. And it really was a very entertaining magazine. It kept uh, this very weird uh sense of humor that and i mean if you look back at it now a lot of it hasn't aged well but at the time it was a breath of fresh air and one of the things that it really did well was the rating system where mm -hmm. it uh used zero to a hundred so the average oh. game a game that was completely average was 50 percent so oh, if you were okay. a game that was okay but did nothing out of the ordinary you got 50 percent Oh, so other than today, where I have the feeling that the average game gets a in eighty percent, and exactly, <laughs> and and this is actually how even magazines back then worked, and this also caused a lot, a lot of negative feelings from other magazines and from game publishers against them, because you know couldn't really compare the ratings between them because you know it was a completely different uh scale that they were using and uh it base it it was a magazine that was fun to read especially in the later days when the number of amiga games and the quality of amiga games really really took a nosedive let's say around 90 94 90, end of 94 beginning of 95 And uh, they they compensated and uh, pepped up the magazine with a lot of additional articles, a lot of other material, a lot yeah. of fun uh, uh, commentary. I mean, famously, there was a cricket game that was so broken and non-functional that I believe almost the entire review was just a list of diseases the reviewer would rather have than play the game. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, things like that, which, you know, was just, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Why not? It, it, it just didn't care. And then, of course, they got into a huge public uh, spat with Team 17, the, uh, and Team 17 of Worms fame. And they were like, oh, these were the gods on the Amiga. They made these great games. And uh, personally, I think most of their games on the Amiga kind of sucked. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but most of them sucked. And they just rated them fairly. When a game was really good, they gave it a really good score. When the game wasn't very good, they gave it a pretty shitty score. And Team 17 just could not handle that. It was like anything below a 90 was considered, you know, sacrilege because they were the gods or something. Uh, and then, of course, they had big public disputes with the heads of Commodore UK because... Well, you're giving bad scores to the games that we're packaging in when we sell new Amigas. You know, that's not helping the system. You're supposed to be helping the system. And they're like, no, we're nope. not. But we don't care about the Amiga, really. I mean, we <laughs> use it to play games. But, you know. We're journalists. <laughs> exactly. And so a lot of fun. Uh, there's also a thing called AP2, which was created a couple years after the magazine died where the uh, writers of the magazine actually created this massive website. You can download the whole thing as basically an HTML stack and uh, where they just kind of diverge and have little conversations with one another about the magazine and different issues that happened and different review scores that they gave and comment on one another and stuff. It's hilarious. It's worth the read. So uh, it's one of those the few magazines where going back to it is always a pleasure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, sticking with magazines, the yes. Playtime magazine launches in Germany. A magazine that is not nearly as fondly remembered as it, as it should be. It was the starting point for the Computech publishing house, which is still going strong today. They basically own every other computer game and hardware magazine. Uh, basically. And they, they really started out even before Playtime with disc magazine. So you mm -hmm. could buy at a kiosk. You know, it was like a two, maybe three page pamphlet and a floppy disk. Uh, Commodore 64 was their big thing. Uh, and as well as Amiga and PC. But Commodore 64 is, I believe, the first one that they published. And then Playtime Magazine was the first full-blown. I mean, and the first issue of it, there's a link to it below, is absolutely god-awful. It's terrible. Uh, but the one thing that they did do, and the reason why I actually used to buy the Playtime Magazine when I was living in Germany, 91 through 92, uh, 93, uh, was because every, or 94, whoa, time fly, flew yeah, yeah. Uh, was that every issue had this big cool fold out poster in it which when you're a teenager is like a really cool thing to have like you know i had this i still have it it's a indiana jones and the fate of atlantis poster mm -hmm. with the little block at the bottom like it's a movie poster you know with the credits and stuff I got it out of the magazine. It was definitely worth the purchase of the magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, there were two spinoff magazines that came out of it. One was Amiga Games. The other one was PC Games. Obviously, Amiga Games is not around anymore, but PC Games is still an ongoing magazine to this day. So uh, Playtime is an important one in the evolution of German uh, magazine publishing just because uh, it – lays the foundation for a company that's still around to this day. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's get naughty. Naughty Bits postpone Stormlord. Razorsoft has had their launch of Stormlord for the Genesis postponed by Sega due to disagreements over issues of nudity in the game. The Viking mythology-based saga features various images of naked fairies, which cause no stir upon release on European home computers, but are apparently in need of some bikinis for U.S. console consumption. 
you know, to me as a European, it's so funny. Um, Americans, you can shoot limbs off, no one gives a damn, but as soon as you see a boob, Oh Lord, that was. Oh work. yeah, oh definitely. And yeah, but and on the other hand, if I was an American, I would be like, they can show naked people all around, but as soon as you shoot someone, it's a big deal. So what's their problem? So <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean it. It is one of those weird things. And remember, this is also in the time period before the ratings board. That's coming. Mm. It's still a few years down the pipeline, but the ratings board is coming. Mm-hmm. And, well, it's not actually, no, 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 it's it's not that many years down the line. We're, we're, we're just around the corner of it, actually. But uh, the, yeah, Stormlord is one of those games that uh, really shouldn't have caused a stir. A stir. And it's not going to go down in history as one of the great games. But it is one of those moments where, you see the difficulty of adapting uh, software to different standards. And I mean, there's there's also a reason why there's a lot of Japanese software that never makes it over just because yeah. you can't do it. Uh, one of the one of the better known examples of this is an arcade game called Puznik uh, by Taito. It's a really cool little puzzle game, super uh, addictive originally in the arcades but every time you solved one of the puzzles in the arcades you got a little bit more of a digitized uh bare-chested woman image in the background of course when brought over to north america that feature was left out Mm -hmm. and the home uh, computer ports in europe even left that feature out so uh it's one of those things where depending on the market you're trying to reach and which kind of people you're trying to reach, you're going to make these compromises. And they did end up covering up the fairies in the uh, console releases of Stormlord. Oh, well, to each their own. Exactly. Bikinis to fairies in America. No Winnie Pooh in China. (laughs) So... Twitch their own. Hey, Speaking Frank. about China, Double Dragon is coming to the movies. And the game really has to do with China, but okay, I, I know it's what you mean. The dragon, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. As if the Mario <laughs> Brothers weren't enough, now the beat 'em up classic Double Dragon is heading to the big screen. Will Billy be called Bimmy? Reference you know, the problem yeah. is I, I don't know the Ra- Double Dragon, but I know the Mario <laughs> Bros. movie, and yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Oh, this so, one's even worse. It's even, this one's even what? worse. It actually the makes hell? the Mario Brothers movie <laughs> look good. So, yeah, so the concept no. of the video game was mm-hmm. two brothers... And one of them has a girlfriend. The girlfriend gets kidnapped by a street gang. So they now have to fight their way through all the the street gang thugs, prostitutes, big giant guys with balls and chains and stuff, Mm -hmm. and then save the girl. That's Double Dragon in a nutshell. This is about two brothers or something who have half each has half of a medallion that they have to join and then apparently some kind of magical stuff happens and it's in a weird dystopian future where there's this guy who runs a giant corporation who wants the metal medallions and he's got all these weird thugs and it's terrible okay yeah so this is what happens when you give uh Way too much, way too many drugs to the screenplay writers. Basically, basically. I mean, the highlight of the movie, the highlight of the movie, sadly, is it has Alyssa Milano of uh, TV fame, of the show Who's the Boss? (laughs) And uh, later on, she does a bunch of other stuff. But at this point, she's still known as the girl from Who's the Boss? And I believe she gets killed at towards the beginning of the movie. And the guy who kills her looks down and is like, so now who's the boss now or something? Oh, it's, Lord. Exactly. That's the level we're working on here. It's 
It's really terrible. Uh, here, one, one sec. mediocre one joke. One second. One second. One second. We're going to take a brief uh, break so that Peter can watch the trailer. Time to skin you guys. <laughs> It's bad. It's really no, bad. It's not just bad. It's <clears throat> no, 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 no. Really, I mean, who on earth thought this was a good idea? I mean, they are highly paid and more or less experienced film creators, and they were sitting together and be like, "Yeah, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's put in some bad video game scenes. Let's put in a weird bloated up guy. Let's." <laughs> do some weird jokes like, do we have to wear this costume all day? What's your step? It, it's it, like I said. I mean, it's, oh, they make a joke about who's the boss now. I mean, it's it's that mm -hmm. level of terrible, and it makes you wonder why we didn't get more video game adaptations back in the day. Mm -hmm. And then it makes you wonder. What kind of horrors did we avoid by not having them? <laughs> Which uh, I think is uh, probably the, answer, uh, the better question to ask. Most likely. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, oh, well, it could have been worse. It could so, have been uh, worse. Yeah, there could have been a double drink too. Oh, oof, yeah. Don't All even right. say that. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Yes. Lucasfilm banned from the ranch. Due to the growing size of the Lucasfilm Games Division, new facilities for the game makers have been arranged in San Rafael. The move to console game development as well as growing teams for PC game asset creation forced the move. Oh, and uh, Ron Gilbert is leaving after finishing Monkey 2, and Greg Hammond, who just won Producer of the Year at GDC, is also leaving. Okay, so they're enlarging and they're having a huge problem with brain drain. Uh, sort of, yeah. So they had to leave the Luke, uh, the Skywalker brain. Now, yeah. uh, if you've listened to my interview with Noah Falstein, uh, he talks lovingly about working at the ranch and all the resources that the ranch had because that's where you know you got the sound stages uh, the sound mixing studios and you've got these beautiful giant libraries and the whole place is designed to essentially tell a story and now suddenly they're in san rafael in an industrial area in this mm -hmm. big facility and uh, yeah, it uh, for a lot of people working at Lucasfilm Games was kind of this, you could experiment, you could do weird, crazy stuff, and you never really had the pressure of having to pull or make a lot of money off the games. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that's starting to dissipate. I mean, Ron Gilbert's going to leave and he's going to be, he's going to create humongous entertainment. He's going to become really, really big in the uh, educational software arena for several years. Uh, Greg Hammond is really just moving to a company that's doing contract work for Lucas. But mm -hmm. you really get the feeling that it's like, you know, this isn't the place we want to be anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But they're also starting to make Star Wars games. So, I mean, they're they're getting more and more into the idea of, hey, we've got these licenses, let's start making games. And they're going to be making some amazing titles. But, uh, yeah, it's it's the that original Lucasfilm, or Lucas game, uh, no, it's Lucasfilm games magic seems to be dissipating. And, yeah, you never played any of the old games, like... Uh, Rescue on Fractalus, or the mm. Eidolon, or Labyrinth, no, or I didn't. Ball Blazer. No, I had just any played Monkey Island 1 and 2 and those things, but none of which you just mentioned. Yeah, well, uh, I'll make sure to put some of them on the list for the mm -hmm. 7 Minutes in Heaven as we sort of hit, you know, it's uh, we're talking... 85, 86, yeah. 87, that era. Yeah. And 
they, some of the stuff they were doing was just so vastly different from anything else that was on the market at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they really were cutting edge and experimental and you know, you didn't see a lot of their games, but when you saw a Lucasfilm game, you were like, oh, this is going to be something extraordinary. Okay. And they never really disappointed. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, um, but still we have a couple more topics to go, so let's move on. New yes. development studios popping up at Computer Game Design Conference. The fifth annual CGDC conference saw new game development companies handing out PR packets. Among them were Dreamers Guild, who would make a name for themselves with Amiga ports of A Train, Dark Seed, and Robosports, and developed I Have No Mouth But I Must Scream, as well as Trilobite, who would make the CD ROM class seventh guest and eleventh hour. Well, good for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know those. Yeah, no, nothing. Just, just good for them. Um, well, what you're really seeing here, and it's kind yeah. of interesting. There's a lot of talk in the in the press around this time about consolidation. We have Sierra Broderbund possibly happening, and MediaGenic getting. Uh, uh, revamped and so forth. And there's also at the same time, because of the generation shift, because we're moving from uh, the 8 bit systems are finally dying, yeah. uh, 16 bit systems and console are, are taking over. Uh, we've got all these new technologies on the horizon, especially CD ROM which is really pushing for completely different models of game development. This idea of the game assets, the graphics and stuff, taking up a huge amount of time and effort in comparison with the programming, which used to be the focus. I mean, in the old days, it was like, okay, I got a couple of pixel figures, and it was the programmer doing the graphics because, mm. well, they didn't really matter. And uh, this shift is something that a lot of existing teams are not going to be able to do. And so the idea that there's whole new teams forming just to tackle these new challenges is uh, it's a sign that there's going to be some new stuff coming. And uh, it's also cool that the uh, Game Developers Conference, or as it's known at this point, the Computer Game Design Conference, is getting bigger, it's getting more uh, professional, and it's also turning up, uh, it's got enough people there that these companies are trying to hire at the conference. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why those conferences really make sense, networking and stuff. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And the fact that the business is getting big enough that that's even an option. Yeah. Uh, shows a certain level of maturity. Exactly. I mean, they've worked on that for a while now, so... Yeah. <laughs> but hey, now that we're done with companies being yes. born, I let's, know, let's I know this is what you've been waiting for. Because I'm waiting for that for the last 11 topics. Um, starting slowly, Houston goes into receivership. Legendary UK software development company and publisher Houston Consultants has entered bankrupt March. Publisher of early titles by the likes of Andrew Braybook, mm. the company never really found its footing in the 16-bit era and has had to shudder. Oh, well, this was really a switch between 8 and 16-bit, wasn't it? So not yeah. there were many companies that really couldn't digest the change. Yeah, and Houston, I mean, a company that had done some legendary stuff. I mean, they published uh, games like Iridium and mm -hmm. Paradroid and one of my all-time favorites, Eliminator, uh, Neb uh, Nebulous. I mean, they were just a huge... Uh, the game that we talked about earlier, Stormlord, was a Houston mm -hmm. uh, published game originally. So... Uh, it was just one of those problems where 
all of the games I just mentioned, all these relatively big titles, while the, a lot of them did also appear on 16-bit systems like the Amiga and the Atari ST, their design was identical to the 8-bit games. So because they were so dependent on the 8-bit market, they were still designing around the limitations of the 8-bit system. So while the graphics had more colors and stuff on the 16-bit systems, you weren't really getting more game. You weren't getting a 16-bit game from them. Yeah. And uh, this is one of those problems. It's like, you know, if if you have an established 8-bit catalog and you're selling the 8-bit catalog mm -hmm. and you're sort of your business is geared around that, making that shift to saying, you know, we're not going to do the 8-bit anymore. Now we're going to do 16-bit exclusive uh, development, stuff that isn't going to be possible on 8-bit. You're taking a huge gamble, and for a lot of these companies, mm -hmm. it's a, it's it's a bridge too far. And Houston is one of those companies that simply has yeah. not made that transition. Exactly, but still, if you there's a new generation, people demand a new generation, and if you can't stick up with that, you're just gone. Exactly. But you know, call where Houston failed, 21st century entertainment would succeed. Andrew Houston. Founder of Houston Consultants is back with new investors and a new company, 21st Century Entertainment. Focused on 16-bit software, the company will launch several sequels to classic Houston titles such as Storm Lord 2 and Nebulous 2, but would find their niche with computer pinball games such as Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies. Hmm. Yeah. Pinball. Pinball succeeded. Okay. Oh, Pinball succeeded. I mean, Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies, they were huge on the Amiga. Um, they were programmed by a company called Digital Illusions, which are better known today as Dice. You mm -hmm. may know them from, uh, yeah. I believe it's the uh, Battlefield series. Battlefield, uh, the Star Wars Battlefront remake and exactly. stuff. Exactly. A battlefield or battlefront, yeah, I can't remember. But this is where they get started. And I believe they're, huh. uh, the main programmer is just a teenager at the time. There were these Scandinavian kids who <laughs> had played a lot of pinball on vacation, and they wanted to basically convert that. And they made this engine to do pinball games on the Amiga. Absolutely brilliant. Of course. And uh, <laughs> played it. I, I used to play pinball fantasies all the time. I mean, it was absolutely addictive as hell uh a little hard and, to go back to nowadays but yeah. and here we are talking about people demanding the next generation and what succeeds pinball well i mean oh, it's well. pinball but it i believe it was running at 60 frames a second it was super smooth scrolling so it would move up and down the physics were spot on so, I mean, it, it was pinball like you had never seen it done on a computer before. Mm -hmm. PC Master Race pinball. Okay. <laughs> Amiga uh, Master Race, please. Amiga. The PC so, sorry, version sorry, was never sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. My, my, my bad, my bad. Yeah, my bad. yeah. Uh, things that happen at midnight. Um, <laughs> oh, wow, it is midnight. Okay, yes. We, we have a few more of these to go through. Exactly. Let's move on. Cinemaware is dead. Long live <laughs> Xbunny Interactive. Acme Interactive. Rob Jacobs' Cinemaware has finally breathed its last. The trailblazing maker of interactive movie classics Defender of the Crown, it came from the desert and wings, has finally succumbed to its financial woes. Jacobs isn't calling it a day just yet, though, and has founded Acme Interactive with several former CinemaWare staffers to complete games still in the pipeline and continue making new titles. And did this work? Did they publish those titles? Uh, they published a few more games up until around 19. Ninety-three, uh, almost all of them sports games. He did some mm. boxing games, uh, basketball, and a and a baseball game or two. The only non-sports game uh, that Acme released, according to Moby Games, is Wings Two, mm -hmm. which was a Super Nintendo game that, uh, yeah, was just god awful. So the least said about it, the better. And uh, that that was. 
it for the original incarnation of Cinemaware. Now, the IP, the Cinemaware IP, I believe, does end up someplace else. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Acme Interactive gets that, uh, probably partially due to the investments made into the company by uh, NEC. And I think he also does finish off some development. There's a few more games with the Cinemaware branding that will show up on uh, the TurboGrafx-16. But uh, for the most part, uh, the Acme stuff doesn't have any direct relationship to uh, the original Cinemaware other than Wings, a sad ending to a wonderful legacy. I mean, Cinemaware really, the importance of Cinemaware in the development of the modern software industry, I think, cannot be overstated just because they they brought in a level of professional artistic uh, presentation to their games that nobody had really tried to pull off in the home computer arena or even in the console arena at that point. Yeah. Uh, this idea of lavish um, screens, lavish artwork, lots of money put into animation that wasn't necessarily always necessary for the game itself, but was there to create atmosphere. That kind of inspired a lot of people. Uh, towards you know, okay, this does we don't just have to worry about uh, the gameplay, and I, like I said, they didn't always succeed in their gameplay. They finally kind of cracked the code with it came from the desert, but a little too uh, it was a little too late uh, to really gain ground, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh well, companies live, companies die, such as CRL, which is dead, and online entertainment, which is alive. Yeah, changes in the air. CRL, another classic UK games publisher that started out as Computer Rental Limited, a computer rental company, and has been publishing games since 1982, has filed for bankruptcy. But the principles of the company are back with Online Entertainment, a company focused on the up-and-coming world of CD-ROM entertainment. They will publish classic early games like Town with No Name and The Lawnmower Man before venturing into online gaming and ultimately online financial services. I like this development. I mean, they started with um, Town with No Name, which sounds like gamey. Then they went to the ultimate um, blue color, uh, white color week and um, activity lawn mowing, and then they <laughs> just surrendered gaming all together and went into financial services. Oh, uh, you've never heard of the lawnmower man, have you? Uh, of course, I haven't. Okay, lawnmower man was a uh, early '90s <clears throat> science fiction film based on a Stephen, very loosely based on a Stephen King story. Uh, <laughs> about virtual reality uh so it's mm -hmm. sort of a horror action movie with a lot of early cgi effects in it uh mm -hmm. pierce brosnan was in it uh yeah so that was this like big overhype this is going to be the movie you have to see these computer effects it it, it, it wasn't that great of a movie mm -hmm. but um it was really overhyped and then they made games based off of it and uh that's the cd rom game based off of it had a lot of uh 3d rendered soft uh imagery and stuff on it mm -hmm. town with no name that's a whole different experience and i yeah as soon as that one gets a review i am definitely Keeping that one for the uh, seven minutes in hell okay. because so let's just oh keep it my in a surprise. Lord. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 going to be an experience. That's just an experience. Okay. Town with no name is a game that you have to experience. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I'm afraid I will. I'm afraid. Yes, I will. yes. But the funny thing is, the company is still around today, but they're no longer in games now. They actually do online financial services. So, hmm. yeah. Go figure. Oh, well, uh, the evolution. Uh, yeah, well, they had to. <laughs> the kids grew up and they wanted to stick with the company. <laughs> and 
now the final topic of today, Palace Software bought by Titus. The French publisher Purchasing Frenzy continues with Palace Software, the game division of Palace, Virgin and Gold, a movie and music distribution company being sold off to Titus. While they would still publish a few titles, they would eventually become the UK office for Titus and be shut down in 1992. Awesome. We buy you to shut you down. Uh, basically, I mean, they, they shut them down as an office, but they got their distribution network. <laughs> I mean, awesome. Uh, that's really what they wanted. I take yeah. that. Thank you. You can keep the people. Yeah. I'm, and I mean, Palace Software hadn't really kept up with the times. It was another one of these companies that was really important in the early 8-bit era, had released some very important games like Cauldron and uh, the Sacred Armor of anti Riad and Barbarian uh, was one of theirs. But their 16-bit output had been mediocre at best. Uh, there was a sort of an RPG thing called Dragon's Breath, uh, which had some interesting ideas, didn't really meld them together. I mean, they they were still working off the model, you know, hey, oh, you have a cool idea for a game. Come over here. Yeah, we'll help you finance the, yeah. the completion of it and we'll we'll publish it, which... In the early days when the games were simple and the teams were small, made sense. As the teams get bigger and the artwork need to get more complex, that model doesn't work. Now uh, the role of the publisher is to finance hmm. is to finance all of that. And, you know, it's just not going to uh, work out. And the company, it was originally a subdivision of a company that was doing video uh, and music publishing, uh, especially in the early 80s when uh, video cassettes were the big upcoming thing and you can make a lot of money off of them because they were massively expensive. Uh, and that's also why one of their very first hits was the game based off of the Evil Dead movie. And... No, it's mm. not a good game. It's actually very, very terrible. But it was through this connection that, you know, they were also the people bringing out the uh, v VHS version of the movie. Hmm. You know, for me, it's just interesting to see that those generation changes always bring some losers and some winners and long-established companies who just do not can't or don't want to adapt to the new technology. They just went basically more or less overnight. Exactly, exactly. And it's one of those situations where the transition to new market conditions, to new technologies and so forth, it, it's tough. It's so unbelievably tough. Uh, you can't, uh, once a company is set into a business model yeah. of how they're going to, uh, finance stuff and how they're going to do stuff, getting out of that, oh man, I mean, it's, it's such a risk. Oh, yeah. And so many companies are going to get stuck with that. And we're going to see the same transition, especially for European companies in about three or four years when they're, they have to make the transition from the Amiga to DOS. Yeah. Uh, or when we see the transition from 2D to 3D asset creation, uh, it's – it's going to be this very difficult, well, you know, we're doing really well in the market. And then suddenly from one day to the other, no, we're not. Oh, yeah. crap. Now we have to develop for this new system. Oh, development time isn't nine months anymore. Now it's three years. How do we finance ourselves for three years? We don't have enough money to pay for three years worth of salaries with no income coming in. Yeah. Boom. And, uh, and this, you're the con. And that's what's going to happen to a lot of those uh yeah. The names that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of years are going to be hitting those problems uh, in a few years as well. 
And we see this transition again and again uh, in the industry. So it's just the way it is. The fun part is you keep seeing the same people show up in new companies. Oh, yeah, sure. And that's the good thing that these guys reinvent themselves. They uh, they just come back and you know, with a new company. And that was the fun part about seeing uh, Jacobs and Houston just basically be like, okay, old company failed. It didn't work out. Drop it like a bad habit. Oh, here's my new company. Let's mm-hmm. start something completely different. Drop it like it's hard. Hey, talking <laughs> about hard and dropping stuff. <laughs> you know where we are at? We're at the end, aren't we? We are at the end. The two hot guys of us are at the end. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's it for this uh, episode of the Video Game Newsroom <laughs> Time Machine. Uh, Peter, do you have any... No, wait, not final See. thoughts. What is the word of the episode? Adaptability. Adaptability. I love it. Good choice. Yes. So uh, before we get to the final thoughts, everybody uh, you can follow us on twitter you can follow us on instagram you can become a patreon patron where you will be able to see peter fail again and again and again and again, and again. at time warp yeah uh, and, uh, and all the other previous ones as well as our interview episodes three months in advance so you know go right ahead sign up and uh final thoughts peter Watching me fail again and again and again is like Einstein's definition of craziness. You do know he never said that, right? Yeah, I just want to believe it's true. Oh, uh, that's true. Okay. Uh, perceived reality is the only true reality or some such nonsense. So Dude, you create your own reality just by the power of your consciousness. Ooh. Oh, I, I know, I know. And then I wake up and realize I still have to go to work. So <laughs> No, 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 no. Then your girl wakes you up and you realize you are not creating anything here. <laughs> You're just following suit. I am just a reactionary element exactly. the with my daughter being the, uh, uh, the only true mover of anything and everything. Exactly. Now, th- th- there is some exactly. truth to this heart. Is, yeah. Your yeah. job is to yeah. adapt and overcome and adaptability. Here we go again. There you go. There you go. Okay, uh, everybody, uh, remember, stay safe out there. Don't do anything we wouldn't do and have fun. Bye.